Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another in our live stream series to help answer questions about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and what it's doing to our mountain towns and communities. It's Teacher Appreciation Week, so this week we thought we'd look at how online learning has go been going and what we can do to help support our children as schooling from home continues for the foreseeable future. My name is David Krause and I'm the editor of the Aspen Times and also the lead of the editor group for Swift Communications, which has publications in Colorado, Utah, and California. We'll be hosting this live stream for about the next 45 minutes and we are pleased to be joined today by Phil Qualman, who is the superintendent for Eagle County School District in Colorado, and Jay Hamrick, who is the director of teaching and learning in the Steamboat Springs School District. We've been collecting questions from our readers uh, to ask our speakers, and we invite you to send questions on this feed, and we'll get to as many of those as we can in the last part of our session. If you are joining us via Zoom, I do ask that you hit your mute button now. And I'd like to quickly introduce the editors in each of the communities that we serve. In Colorado, we have Lisa Schlichtman, who is the editor at Steamboat Pilot in Today. Peter Bowman is the editor at the Glenwood Springs Post Independent. Nicole Miller is at Summit Daily News. Eli Pace is at the Sky High News, which serves Grand County. Nate Peterson is at the Vale Daily. Josh Carney is at the Craig Press. And Kyle Mills is at the Rifle Citizen Telegram. In Utah, Bubba Brown is the editor at the Park Record in Park City. And in California, Bill Rozak is at the Tahoe Tribune and Brian Hamilton is at the Sierra Sun and Grass Valley Union. We also have agricultural publications out on the plains. Rona Johnson leads up the team at the Fence Post and editors Carrie Statham and Mariah Tibbetts are at the Tri-State Livestock News and Farm Rancher Exchange. So our viewers know after the live stream, we'll post this Q&A to all of our websites as well as social media with the other live streams in our series, which started in March. And with that, I will turn over the conversation to Kelly Geary Agnew, who is the marketing strategist for Swift Communications and has been working with our editors on this project as well as to our panelists. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks everyone for being here today. So real quick before we get into questions, I'm just gonna give each of our panelists a few moments to introduce themselves. So Phil, we'll start with you. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, my name is Philip Qualman, uh, superintendent for Eagle County School District. Uh, happy to be in my first year uh, full-time in this capacity, but I've been with the district for 16 years and worked in Eagle County uh, off and on since the early 90s. So I've watched this community grow uh, physically and, uh, and watched the school district grow tremendously in terms of student count and, uh, and innovate and evolve. So I'm, I'm happy to be in this role and, and helping guide us through uh, these challenging times. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for being here today. And Jay, over to you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Kelly. My name is uh, Jay Hamrick. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning for the Steamboat Springs School District. This is my second year in that position. Um, prior to that, I was Assistant Principal at the Which Steamboat Springs. Tremendously in terms of student. Uh, uh, assistant yeah. Principal at the middle school. So I've uh, been in Steamboat for uh, three years now and, three, and as well in Colorado. Before that, I was in West Virginia as a high school principal and uh, worked overseas for uh, in, international schools for over 10 years and it's just um, been a fabulous experience with my family out here to Steamboat Springs, Colorado and to uh, be a part of an amazing school district. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. So like Dave mentioned, we've prepared some kind of basic questions I think of around what people are hearing and what's going on with education and how things are changing. I know in a lot of our markets, the school year is getting uh, close to wrapping up. So we wanted to cover a little bit of what the challenges have been, what the learnings have been, and maybe what the future looks like. So to kick it off, what are some of the challenges that students have faced with the move to online learning? And 
I guess we addressed this question to, to students specifically, but maybe if you guys want to speak to challenges for, for teachers and educators as well, whoever wants to jump in first. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Go for it. I think the primary challenge that, that our students have faced uh, is adjusting to instructional practices that are all online. Um, this generation of students are definitely digital natives, but they're used to being in classrooms and working face-to-face -face with teachers and peers. So shifting everything uh, on a dime uh, over the period of 72 hours to, uh, to remote learning was, was certainly a, cha a change for them. It was a dramatic change for them. And I think they're still learning to make that adjustment. Uh, we've also had some uh, technical challenges in terms of, of just accessing the units and materials. Uh, so we've distributed a lot of uh, Chromebooks and a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots to students throughout Eagle County uh, to make sure that they all have access. Um, and I think the, the other change that we have to be mindful of is uh, just the home situation is very different for every child. So we've got some home situations where parents are are away and they're still working and there's no one home to, to monitor the kids. Uh, so they have to demonstrate some intrinsic motivation to sit down and engage in learning. Uh, and then you have some situations where parents aren't, aren't working. Uh, maybe they lost their job. Um, our tourism industry here stopped very abruptly in mid-March. Uh, so we've got some students who have uh, space in their home set aside for learning and, and others who, who live in crowded situations where there isn't a, a quiet place where they can sit down and do homework. So I, I think the, uh, the challenges that they face is really just that their world was turned upside down and a lot of the stability that they knew in terms of the relationships at their schools and with their teachers and with a, a schedule that, that they were familiar with changed so quickly that uh, they haven't had much of a chance to, to adapt to that. So these are ongoing challenges. Uh, we, we haven't solved all these problems yet, uh, but we're, we're a learning organization and um, just as the kids are learning to adapt, so are we as adults. Sure, that makes sense. Jay, how about you over in Steamboat, anything that you would add to those challenges? Well, first, I agree with everything that uh, Philip just described. Uh, same experience, I think uh, every district in the country could probably relate uh, to those very similar struggles and challenges. Um, I think I'd, the only thing I, I, I would just uh, continue on with is, is the is the isolation of students learn, learning in isolation and not having those uh, connections with their friends and with their teachers has a dramatic impact on their lives and how they're feeling and their social and emotional well-being. Um, as we know, school is a social learning experience and context. And um, our teachers are working extremely hard trying to use media and distance learning and different forms that to connect the students, but that face-to-face in-person relationships has, has taken its toll. And um, I know that it's very challenging, not just for our, our high school, middle school, but all, all the ages. And, and it impacts uh, the kids' moods, sleeping patterns, eating patterns, healthy habits. It, it's had a dramatic effect. and. Uh, and I think that's the real struggle and, and um, that we're all facing, not just the kids, but the parents and teachers as well. Um, and it's just, um, you know, I, I've seen and heard many times our kids who will just uh, wake up crying or upset because their sports are taken away or I can't do this, my final theater project and it's painful and it's hurtful. And so um, I think, you know, that, that, that social emotional piece is something that can't be uh, overemphasized that the, the, the strains on that and the so supports and resources that we need to provide and the care that we need to give as a, a school community and families that to, to help address those challenges. Sure, that makes sense. And it's, it goes beyond just, you know, my, what might happen as far as the learning plan in the classroom or whatever project you're working on but into all those other things and, and values that students get from their school experience, right? Absolutely. So knowing kind of what those challenges are, um, maybe Jay, start with you. What are some things that parents can do to support their students during this time? And maybe what do teachers and schools need from parents to help set their kids up for success or help them kind of move through this, this challenging time period? 
Well, you know, I think everyone, we have as parents, we have these expectations of if we can control this or make this decision. This will help my kid solve this problem or get through this tough time and everything's going to be okay. And the reality of the situation is we're not in control of some of these things that are in play. Oh, and, uh, and to be okay with that and, 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 and to, to make those connections with your kids and to understand that your relationship with your child is the most important thing and to check in with them, to check on their social emotional well-being, have conversations and understand that their frustrations are real and, and, and it sometimes might come out in different ways. And, and to step back and, and, and not to feel like you have to control and, and, and that some of these uh, behaviors and, and reactions are normal. I think it's important, as I said, to check in uh, uh, and to see how they're doing emotionally, how they're doing academically, and also physically. Uh, I know that as, as we're moving through this distance learning, kids are sitting behind computers for hours upon ends and to have a good schedule where they're getting out and moving and doing good physical exercise, uh, working in their yard, uh, whatever capacity, doing community service learning, whether it's even for community service with your local neighbor or just within your family, but um, getting from out behind the, the screens and, and, and taking care of that physical as well as the social emotional is a huge piece. And, and bring laughter as much as possible into your family. Um, watch a good funny movie or play cards and joke, but try to, we're, we're dealing with such serious issues that I think we all need to smile more and, and to bring laughter uh, and joy into our lives as much as possible. So being intentional about that as parents is extremely helpful. Once we get those, you know, that, that, uh, those essential needs taken care of, the learning can come from behind, uh, can come next. And, and, and I think sometimes as parents, we were like, oh, my kid's gonna get left behind, but we gotta understand the whole country, every district is this, and yeah, we aren't gonna be learning as well as we normally do, but we're working on that and we're gonna try and make it better. But uh, I, I guess my, my, my final words be, you know, it's okay, everything's gonna be all right. Um, give yourself a break, connect with your kids. I think that's really good advice. I, I like the piece about laughter. Phil, how about you? Would you add anything to, to Jay's ideas? Yeah, I, I think the messaging that we've tried to get out to, to families, uh, parents, and guardians is uh, to work with kids uh, to try to set a schedule that, that makes sense for the family. Uh, we're not trying to duplicate school at home. It's not, it's not manageable. It's not reasonable. Uh, so do what you can do that makes sense for your family and give the kids a voice in setting that schedule. Uh, if they like working better in the afternoon, then set them down for a couple hours in the afternoon. If they like to get it out of the way right when they wake up, let them, let them do that. So give them some voice, give them some control, uh, but be consistent. So once you've established an expectation, uh, the kids are gonna need the parents and guardians to stay engaged and, and uh, monitor the work that they're doing and be there to assist if, if necessary. So uh, the, the set schedule, with student voice, with some flexibility, and, and consistency of expectations is, is important. Cool, that makes sense. I think a set schedule is good advice for most of us. So maybe looking at the bigger picture, Phil, maybe start with you. What are kind of some of the strategies you're putting in place maybe on the district level, what schools are doing to address these challenges and kind of adjust the, the structural way that our education works? When we made the initial pivot to remote learning, uh, we trained teachers initially in, in how to, to move their instruction and what resources we had at their disposal and created a district website to, to help them in that process. That website also contained portals for students and for parents. So each of those groups required specific training uh, in what to expect and, and how to access the different resources. So that first week was really a, you know, understanding the platforms. Um, understanding how your teacher was going to communicate with you. Um, the next step was to get consistent with teachers about uh, posting their office hours. So we wanted teachers to be available to parents and to students in a very predictable way and an easy to reach way. Uh, so those uh, office hours are posted by school 
uh, so parents and students can figure out when they can contact each of their teachers and, and get that individualized support. Uh, and, and some of the teachers are setting up uh, synchronous instruction or synchronous gatherings so they can bring kids together in online format so they can see their peers and, and participate in activities that feel somewhat like they're in a regular classroom. Uh, but, but Kelly, I got to admit that uh, uh, consistency has been our challenge. I mean, we, we built this model uh, on a, you know, uh, at the drop of a hat and uh, it's got problems. And I think that one of the, the biggest problems that we've recognized is that we have, we have a lot of different instructional platforms in play between kindergarten through 12th grade and including advanced placement in college courses. We, we've got you know, dozens of different resources that, that teachers are utilizing. So for parents that have kids in multiple grade levels in multiple, uh, multiple schools, it is, a, it is a cumbersome process. And uh, you know, if we are in a situation in the fall where we have to continue this um, remote learning or some mixed model, uh, we've got some refinements that we need to make over the summer, um, acknowledging that um, the system is, is cumbersome, that, that expectations are, are pretty inconsistent between levels and between grades. So uh, we, we made some, some massive changes in a hurry and uh, we, we've got to make some of those corrections over the summer. Yep, that makes sense. I, I hadn't thought about what, how challenging it might be for parents who have kids at different levels to kind of navigate that overall landscape. Jay, how about you over in Steamboat? Yeah, um, as Phil had mentioned earlier, um, kids' readiness and preparation and the resources and family situations are vast. Um, and trying to engage those students with um, um, is extremely challenging. Um, and we're having you know, better luck with some students and other grade levels and ages uh, than others. And so just recognizing that um, this, is, this is challenging for a wide variety of reasons uh, to, to, to have students attend and, and fully engage. And so I think, uh, um, we have a really good system in place at all of our schools as far as identifying, tracking students' uh, participation, engagement level, and the quality of participation. And we have uh, teacher teams um, that are checking in daily, weekly, to see where the students are and um, doing whatever it takes to connect to those students and try to learn their st stories, whether it's phone calls. In some cases, it's even driving by their house to see where they are, how they're doing, or emailing, whatever type of communication we can to better understand where our kids are coming from, what their needs are. And uh, obviously, once we kind of identify, you know, what barriers or limitations or challenges are existing is trying to connect them with school or community resources so that we can better engage with that student. And so I think there's just been a lot of behind the scenes work that, um, our, from our parents, or excuse me, from our teachers and our counselors and our administration, trying to make this work for every kid and their family and understanding it is gonna look different for every kid and we're gonna differentiate our instruction and our expectations for those kids because like I said before, it's not in there, it's something that they can control always. And so just a lot of hard work behind the scenes, conversations and care and connections of resources trying to help the kids, not just academically, as I said, but socially, emotionally, and physically. Sure, I can imagine it's challenging to, to figure out how to uh, adjust it to the individual needs of different students and different families. It's extremely challenging. And then trying to fall within the, some of our school expectations of grading and uh, um, testing, it just doesn't work that well sometimes. So I think both of you touched on this a little bit. Maybe Jay, start with you, and then I'll pass it back to Phil. Um, resources that students and parents can access, what, what you have available in your district, and maybe what you might recommend people use to help them and their family and their student navigate this time. Sure. And, um, you know, I think similar to Eagle County, we're, we're, we're very fortunate to live in a small community that is fortunately does have a uh, quite a few uh, resources and, and, and organizations that are willing and ready to help our families in need. And so um, 
our, our counseling team across the district has an amazing website that, um, you know, not just uh, educational resources or um, school counseling uh, uh, resources, but how you can get linked into different organizations who might help you navigate with whatever needs might be. So um, uh, I've also, one of the fortunate uh, community organizations we have is Integrated Community, who helps uh, with uh, our families who are new to our, our community um, from other countries, um, other cultures, and they've really stepped up and created a, a vast amount of resources for families um, um, who, who uh, might have language barriers. And, and one of the, the amazing things that they're doing is uh, um, they actually have a, adult volunteers um, in our community and connecting them with uh, students who need tutoring and those those volunteers don't have to be speaking a second or third language. They can just you know obviously speak be speaking English, but just sitting down with them virtually and connecting with uh, some of our students who uh, um, need some extra support. So um, we have uh, quite a few resources like that on our district uh, webpage that are connecting uh, families with those supports. I think that's an important point. A lot of our mountain communities have those kind of diverse populations maybe have language barriers and some of those things are probably coming to light right now um, as we're trying to navigate these changes. Phil, how about Eagle County? What, what resources has Eagle County put out there, maybe similar or different? Well, Jay touched on counselors already. I, I think they're an important resource for every district and ours, ours are doing similar work. Um, and I, I think other staff members uh, to mention our, our teachers and principals. Uh, they know our kids the best and they're typically the easiest to contact. Uh, so their, their emails and phone numbers are all posted online and on their websites. So when uh, kids get frustrated or parents get concerned about their kids, that's the first place to reach out to uh, in our organization is check in with those who are closest to the kids and, and see what kind of support they can provide. Uh, we're also fortunate that we have uh, some community organizations like the Hope Center um, Eagle Valley Behavioral Health and Mind Springs that are uh, offering a lot of telecounseling sessions and uh, additional supports for families in need, uh, including the, the food bank here in Eagle County. Um, a lot of that information can be found on our school district website, uh, eagleschools.net. And we have, uh, we actually have a technical helpline that we set up for parents and students who are trying to access their uh, lessons online or, or find their teachers or connect to a, a new hotspot that we provided and they can call that hotline uh, and get technical support in English or Spanish. So uh, we're, we're learning what the needs are and trying to be responsive. Uh, and every week we, we learn of new needs and, and need to adjust our system to, to try to be as, um, as responsive as we can. Right, absolutely. Connecting a lot of different pieces there. So I think this is a question everybody's thinking about right now um, as the school year is getting close to wrapping up and we know um, this probably doesn't have answers or maybe it looks a couple <laughs> of different ways. <laughs> uh, maybe whoever wants to start on this one kind of what maybe what are you planning for? What are you hoping for? And kind of how are you going to adjust your plan as needed for next school year? Yeah, Kelly, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> the fall going to look like uh, and, and right now we we don't really know uh, every county Same here Phil <laughs> every county is uh, moving through the different phases to, to open businesses and uh, you know cycle through the safer at home procedures uh, so we really are, are entering into the summer with three potential outcomes first outcome is plan a which is re return to school in August and everything's normal uh, I, I think that that is becoming increasingly unlikely uh, that we end up in that plan. Plan B would be some type of a blended model where we are doing some small group in-class instruction mixed with the remote learning that we've set up uh, in the spring. So that comes with a lot of logistical challenges. Um, we've got school buses that can hold 50 kids, uh, but they're not six feet apart. And we've got classrooms that can hold 25 kids in cafeterias that could hold 200 to, to 500. Uh, but, but none of those environments are, are set up to allow six feet of distance. So if we need to do that, uh, it's gonna take some dramatic changes to our schedules and to our logistics to, to blend 
some type of in-class instruction in small groups supplemented by what, what we can still uh, set up in remote learning. Uh, that is probably our most likely option and one that we're putting most of our energy into to thinking uh, and, and planning around right now. Um, the third option, plan C, is the worst case scenario, and that is that we are still restricted from bringing kids into schools and that we're learning 100% remotely from home. So right, right now we've got most of our chips in plan B, uh, trying to figure out a blended model, uh, learn from what we have tried in the last uh, six or seven weeks and make some adjustments over the summer and uh, come back in the fall with some new uh, refined but uh, creative solutions. Sure, Jay, how about Steamboat, similar plans? Exactly, exactly. Um, I think it's also, um, to add to what Phil said, is also in preparation that if we're in plan B, if we're in plan B uh, in August, that we're also prepared um, in a month's time, two months time to go to plan C, back to the remote distance learning, because we know that the, the scenes could be changing, coronavirus could have a spike increase and so all the advice we're getting is we're going to have to remain to be flexible and adaptable with whatever plan and it's as you can imagine trying to um, as a school system as a school district and individual schools trying to be adaptable and flexible and meet all these needs can be it's daunting and, and takes a lot of work and thoughtfulness to do it right so uh, um, we're just uh, I think that's kind of been our uh, our our motto is just being flexible, adaptable, and, and solution-oriented. For sure. That makes sense. I think maybe maybe for both of you, but are you planning for, you know, maybe parents have to go back to work and kids need extra support. They had a parent at home and now they don't. Kind of those type of changing home situations too, depending on how things go as businesses open up. Yeah, absolutely. As, as Jay said, we got to be flexible. Uh, we're going to have to adapt to all kinds of different home situations. Uh, so it, before this happened, um, we focused a lot on, on differentiation and, and making sure that teachers were aware of the needs of each of their kids. Uh, we just expanded the need for differentiation and, and layered on uh, a lot of different uh, places where kids may have support or not support, where they may have been engaged in studies over the last seven weeks or may not have been. So the need for differentiation now is greater than it has ever been. It sure makes sense. All right, Dave, have you pulled together some questions from our audience? I do have some questions from our audience. Thank you. Um, feel free to keep adding to our stream. We've got a few um, that we can cover in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes would be great. Um, the first one, uh, I think with some of the, kind of stems from some of the online challenges and, and some children not having great access to uh, remote situations. But um, do you see you know, what happened to having books and do you see a comeback in or a resurgence in using books versus online in the fall? Well, I think it depends on which model that we're talking about. Um, as far as, um, you know, we're also looking at different grade levels and, and what's available as far as resources, what, as far as using textbooks at the high school level and reading literature books in elementary, you know, two different type of uh, ball games that we're talking here. I know that, I would say this, that, you know, there are many silver linings to this uh, pandemic that we're in and our staff looking at these blended learning models and learning so much from it, I think are going to be some real positive takeaways and that we're going to be continuing to use Google Classroom and Google Meets and virtual lessons and some really amazing resources and structural materials, materials are now being utilized and implemented. And so will textbooks be in our school systems? Absolutely. At what grade level, what way? I, I can't answer that directly, but I, I just want to speak to the, uh, the silver linings that we're also finding that I do see education having a very positive shift uh, when we get, when we redefine what normal is and uh, some really amazing uses of technology that is highly engaging to many of our students. Many of our students are actually enjoying some of the features of virtual learning and uh, 
making them more independent, but and independent, but independent, accountable, and creative, innovative thinking going on. Bill, do you see a resurgence in books, or uh, how does that kind of come into a plan A, B, or C? Book, books always play a role in, in our programming. Um, just this week, we, we uh, communicated with our library district and uh, we're getting information out to our parent community about uh, reading programs to continue through the summer. So uh, our, our libraries will make books available to kids uh, through, throughout the summer so they can continue reading and engaging. But I, I think to extend on Jay's comment, um, we, we gotta recognize that we're dealing with digital natives. He's, you know, our students today have, have grown up with uh, cell phones in their hands and, and smart tablets in their hands. And they, they are, are uh, of, of a generation where uh, they can, with a, the touch of a finger, link to something in a video that, that explains a concept that they can't understand from text. So they're learning from multiple media. And I think that's what they need to be trained for in the future. And, and some of that is still textual. So there will be places where, where books Re remain part of the curriculum, but there will definitely be uh, just one part of many in a, in a multimedia environment that our kids are growing up in. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question kind of goes to the um, emotional, uh, social and emotional question or conversation we were having at the beginning. Um, what are some signs I should look for with emotional concerns versus everyday behavior? Bill, you want to start with that? Sure. I, I think that the, the fear that we have for our kids is, and, and Jay mentioned this word earlier, is isolation. Uh, they're doing a lot of their lessons in solitude. Uh, they don't have that time to connect with their peers or with their teachers on a regular basis. So um, that, that isolation could lead itself to, to withdrawn behavior. Uh, it could lead them into uh, you know, different, different rabbit holes on the internet that they may not need to be exploring. So uh, being mindful of, of what kind of online activity kids are having is important. Um, keeping them engaged in, in fun activities outside of, of classroom activities is important too. Uh, so finding that time to, to have family activities that are, that are outside or that are physical uh, or that are, are just traditional games, you know, just making sure that kids have social interaction uh, even if it's not uh, the type of typical physical interaction they might have uh, with their peers, still finding ways to, to make sure that, that they are, you know, as Jay mentioned earlier, laughing and having fun. Uh, and you, you just got to really keep asking them questions. Uh, keep inquiring about what the work is that they're doing or what the topics are that they're studying. So the more they can be connected to, to other humans, uh, the, the better off they're going to be. Jay, any other signs that parents uh, that, for? Bill, that, that was excellent advice. Um, I would, you know, just continue to emphasize that that emotional response is, is going to be normal. And if 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 you if you do start to feel like your your child is protecting themselves, closing out shutting down a little bit is to reach out to your counselors, have the conversation, they wanna talk and they can put you in a connection with um, community resources. Um, I've got a high school student myself and I, I fight daily, struggle daily with him getting out of bed and wanting the lights off and wanting to sleep till 10 or 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. And, and, and I'm like, this is not what's healthy for you. And so of course we struggle, we battle, we argue, get out of bed, go get some exercise. and those are normal behaviors for sure. But when it becomes just that since the depression and the hopelessness, uh, don't hesitate, don't hesitate at all to get in contact with, uh, as Phil said, a teacher, a trusted adult in your, in your family or, or with a school counselor and have that conversation and just keep engaging with those, with your kid, even though they might push you away and argue with you they want you to love them and care for them. So just continue to um, connect. Uh, here's the next one, um, kind of about grading and what it looks like. What about grades? Should we move away from A, A through F and look more toward a pass fail model? Yeah, in you know? county schools, we, we had to make some adjustments to grading practices. 
Um, so we've adopted a pass or a no grade option. So it, it's, not, um, it's not something that we're doing automatically, especially in high school. We understand that there are a lot of students who still are seeking traditional grades because they want to, uh, they want to apply to competitive college and university programs and their GPA is important to them, their transcripts are important to them. So uh, for those who uh, just want to make sure that they can get out of this semester without damaging their grades or their GPA, we've afforded them an op opportunity to select no grade, uh, which would have no impact on their GPA. Uh, it's GPA neutral, and uh, it would result in them retaking a course if, if they need to. Uh, but because of, of no fault of their own, they may not have the access at home or the home support to stay engaged. So we didn't feel like it was fair to to punish them with a, with a bad grade, uh, but we wanted to give them a, 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 a graceful way uh, to, to uh, ex accept a, a no grade in a course without it being an F. So it took a lot of conversations with our, our principals and our teachers and parents and students to land on the policy that we have implemented, but we think that it, it empowers them uh, to select a, a grading mechanism that makes sense for them, um, while at the same time uh, being empathetic to the situations that are, are different across our community. I, I'd say Steamboat responded the exact same way as, as Phil just described with our high school students. Um, and um, just like Phil said, um, we, we, did, we, we wanted to hold kids harmless for our conditions and education that they can't control. And so we gave them options as far as the uh, pass or no credit if they weren't able to um, participate in um, the distance learning and it would hold the kids harmless, it wouldn't impact their GPA, as well as an option for at the high school level again, um, for them to receive a grade um, at the, um, and per course. So they could select this class, I want pass, no credit, or a letter grade. And we did, we did say that the letter grade, when we um, would, would not get worse, couldn't be lowered uh, from the March date uh, when uh, the coronavirus and school closure, so it could only improve. So kids have option and flexibility and voice on, on how they can be assessed and how it would impact their GPA at the high school level. It's just, um, it is a unfair, difficult situation and, and, and grading uh, um, is, a, is a difficult subject. Uh, when we're talking about the instructional delivery that we're having. Jay, do you see that uh, just as a, a wider view, do you see pass fail becoming more into the educational models going forward in the next year or two years if this carries on and what that looks like? I do. I know the post-secondary education is also doing similar um, types of systems uh, uh, at the college level. Um, I, I know that some aspects of education when you when you take out the grading there's some liberation to that that you know we're going to be learning for learning's sake and we don't have to worry about what is an a what is a b let's let's just look at the essence of learning and instruction and having high quality and 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 of course give feedback and and you know uh suggestions and advice on how to improve things so there are some uh, liberating aspects of that and it really honing in on just the essence of what education and learning is. And, and that can be fun and exciting when you uh, don't have to do A, B, C, and D and some of the arguments and, that come from that. So uh, possibly, I don't know, that's a big change and a big shift uh, in education when, when, when you're, when you're uh, messing with uh, grades and evaluations. Yeah, it's interesting how this will, that's a, it's an interesting question how it could set up for the future yep. on, on grading and all that. It is such a pressure point. Um, I think this is a good uh, question to end our live webinar on, and I think it's a great one, um, is uh, what is the best thing I can do to help a teacher? Phil, why don't you start with that? Is this coming from a, from a parent or? Yeah, sure, I'm sorry, from a parent, one of our viewers, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I think if we go back to uh, earlier in our conversation, uh, what does it take for the kids to be successful in this new climate? So uh, putting on, putting on my, my parent hat, I got two engaged in remote learning as well. And uh, it, it can be a chore for, for, for any, of, any of us 
Uh, so I, I think that uh, communicating with teachers has been helpful, uh, understanding their expectation, because I, I can tell you that my, my kids may not always be 100% forthright about what the task is that they're supposed to do or the amount of time that they spent on that task. So <laughs> if I can communicate with the teachers and understand directly what the expectations are, they know that I'm actively engaged in, in, uh, in monitoring what my kids are doing and that we have a unified front uh, in, in approaching what the students should be doing. So keeping communication open, I think between parents uh, and teachers is, is the best thing that they, that they can do right now. Adding to that, there's nothing better than when I open up my inbox on my email as an administrator or as a teacher, and I get a nice note from a parent saying, thank you for reaching out, you made my child's day. That one simple little gesture, two, three sentence thing can brighten up a, a, a teacher's day or week. And they're under a lot of stress. And in some cases, criticisms. And I think just reaching out, making that positive little gesture can be so uplifting and, and feel so good. So, um, and encourage uh, your, your child's uh, uh, a parent, uh, a friend to do the same. That means a lot. Great. Well, that's a good one. I appreciate that, Jay and uh, Phil. appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with us today about this and what's going on. And, and it's nice that we have people from mountain communities who are sharing their experiences because I think a lot of our school districts are very similar in the way that uh, we do learning and uh, have access to our teachers. So thank you both for joining us today uh, and taking the time out. Uh, a reminder that we will have this uh, video available for replay on all of our local newspapers websites for you to watch and share um, along with our other live streams. And they'll also be on our social media on our Facebook pages. We will be back next week with another live stream in our series. For the Swift Communications, my name is David Krause from the Aspen Times along with Kelly Geary Agnew with Swift Communications. We thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, David. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Good luck.